All right, it's 9.30 here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Sanjay Mishra, and I am joined by my co-chairs, uh, Kevin Ma and Chris Lemons. And uh, first off, welcoming uh, Chris Lemons, uh, joining as a co-chair. Um, so please uh, welcome uh, Chris Lemons. Um, as some of you already know that Chris has been involved with CDNI uh, for some time, so uh, he's quite familiar with with some of the work that's been already going on, and he's been a contributor um, and also a reviewer, reviewer of C CDNI documents, so he's pretty familiar with it. Um, welcome, Chris. Uh, with that, let's begin. Uh, just want to make sure that you all, please, that, that are in the room, um, click on the uh, uh, attendance, the, the blue sheet. It's not showing here, but you'll see it. Uh, it'll come back here. All right, so um, note well. Um, you probably have already seen this before, but if not, uh, please take a note of it. Um, and while you do that, um, note well, note very well, uh, make sure that um, um, we treat each other with respect and professional professionally. So uh, everything that you need to know is up there. All right, um, with that, these are some of the meeting tips. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, continuing on some of the resources that are available um, if you have anything that you need to look at. And of course, welcome Chris. And with that, I think Kevin, I'm gonna give it to you and um, you can walk through some of the slides here. Sure, thanks Sanjay. Um, Hopefully everyone noticed that RFC 9538 was published. This is the ACME um, TLS delegation draft, uh, or, or the ACME draft. Um, we also have the TLS subsearch draft for delegation as well, but um, we've been working on this draft for a long time. Um, and so I appreciate all the hard work that the authors put into this and congratulations on, on pushing it over the line. Um, it was, uh, It was hopefully relatively painless, though it did take us a long time to get there. Um, so congratulations and, and good work to everyone. Next slide. So we have two other um, drafts that we did send out last calls for. Um, one is, as I mentioned, the delegate credentials draft. Um, thank you to Christoph for putting in all the work there. And thank you to Mike, our sector early reviewer. Um, I think we we made a couple revisions and um, we've made some good updates from a security perspective. So hopefully it will be um, well received by the IESG. The last call will end in, the, in a week from today and then I will put in the, the Shepherd write up and we'll take it from there. Um, similarly, we have the capability, uh, cap capacity capability advertisement extension draft. Um, Sanjay sent out the last call for that. We have two weeks on that one. But um, I think that one's in pretty good shape as well. Um, there's nothing, uh, we, we got through all the contentious pieces. Um, it's, it's a pretty straightforward draft. So hopefully that one will go easily. Uh, as always, please go and read the drafts. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, or support, please just respond to the list to that last call. Um, otherwise, we will, once those close, we will, we will move forward with submitting them to the IESG. Sanjay, next slide. Um, these are our existing milestones. As you can see, we missed the we missed our dates for the TLS subsearch draft. That's okay. We got the early review. Um, there's a reason we were working through those comments. Um, I think that one's fine. Uh, we did finally get out the last call for the capacity draft, so those should be taking care of themselves here shortly. Um, we have the other drafts on the list, the triggers interface, which we'll get an update on. I think we're close. We had some good reviews last time around. And so hopefully we can push that over the line. Um, I know we had to we had to do some switch up with the editors on that draft, but uh, and there's still a couple of questions outstanding from Alan, but but we'll we'll address that today. Um, and then we have the new drafts that that we we did the adoption for last time around. Um, next slide. So we have a lot on the agenda for today. Um, we have three pages of agenda. Uh, I won't go through it all, but um, obviously, we're going to discuss the drafts that we have milestones for. We have a bunch of new drafts that have come in. And so um, I think we should probably just get right on to it. Yeah, yeah. 
So I think this is all the list of uh, drafts that we're going to be discussing today. Um, but with that said, given we have a pretty packed agenda, why don't we get started with the first set of slides here? And let's see if I can bring up the next deck here. I assume you can see and hear me now. Oh, I'm not up yet. So. Yeah, so we're, we're going to start with uh, with Jay uh, okay. to give an update on the uh, on the triggers uh, second edition version. Um, I think, as Kevin said, we are getting very close uh, to the finish line. Um, but that said, uh, I'll let Jay take it over from here and then walk us through and uh, let us, you know, give us an update as to where you are and uh, what needs to be done. Okay, uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, I'm Jay Robertson, and today I will be presenting the update for the second edition of the CDNI Control Interface and Triggers. Um, so just a little bit about me, uh, my, my work with Cache Purge over at Quilt prompted my interest in this, and I'm uh, the newest member of the uh, team that is helping out with uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, specification, and I appreciate Nir and Sanjay extending me this opportunity to co contribute toward the development. So, uh, so without further ado, we'll move on to the next slide. So first we'll cover uh, what has changed from V9. Uh, at IETF, Sanjay presented the changes in V9. Now we'll cover uh, uh, what has changed since that version. Uh, the current version is V11. So we have had two versions since IETF 118. V10 had no real consequen consequential changes. It was only made uh, uh, to keep the draft from expiring on January 31st. However, uh, V11 did and was mainly a cleanup draft. Uh, I effectively re uh, read the entire thing uh, uh, last year and developed a set of grammatical and spelling, uh, a list of grammatical and spelling errors. Uh, Kevin Ma did much the same thing and I combined the two lists together and effectively uh, did an update uh, to the specification to incorporate all of that feedback there. Uh, additionally, I responded to the three issues raised by uh, 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 by Iana, uh, which were uh, which were covered in uh, IETF 118. These were the three nits that were mess uh, that were messaged during that that were mentioned during that particular period of time, uh, mostly with regard to the uh, uh, registries in section 11, uh, clarification with the language uh, regarding sub-registries versus registries and registries versus registry groups, uh, as well as the uh, language with regard to uh, uh, the word, use of the word repeat versus reusing definitions for trigger types. So all of that has now been incorporated. And probably the most consequential change of all of these is the fact that uh, uh, per suggestion from Kevin Ma, we switched from uh, uh, PCRE to uh, POSIX Section 9 Extended Regular Expressions, uh, which makes it very, very con consistent with the other specifications of this type over here. So nevertheless, uh, the diff is available at the link below over here in case anyone is interested in all the changes, but uh, effectively it's a lot of cleanups that have been done in order to uh, uh, correct a lot of spelling and grammatical errors more than anything. All right, next slide. So the next issue that we'll cover is uh, an, an issue with regard uh, to date local time versus ISO 8601. Uh, this is one of the uh, issues that Kevin Ma raised in his review of the specification. Uh, as he noted, uh, it seems like we're uh, spending a lot of effort just uh, to get a date time with no time zone. Uh, can we just use ISO? 8601 local time. And uh, so we spent a little bit of time contemplating uh, some of the reasons why we had gone uh, down this particular road over here. I think the uh, just for a little bit of background here, uh, uh, this is this pertains to section 8.2.3 of uh, the uh, uh, section two of the uh, second edition of the spec, and it follows section 432 of ISO 8601 
as a complete date and time extended representation. So it is compatible with that, uh, but it has both the time zone and the decimal seconds uh, elided in this particular case here. The reason that we had uh, aimed to do something a little bit different was mainly towards uh, simplicity. We didn't want to go and burden the API developers with uh, having to go and support some of the uh, things that ISO 8601 supported uh, with regard to uh, exact accuracy, uh, decimal fractions of a, of a second, as well as uh, leap seconds, and uh, uh, and effectively how some of that goes and translates into uh, uh, some of the strange time uh, representations. So. Uh, Nevertheless, because we did not need this level of accuracy, uh, uh, we formed this date local time to make it a little bit simpler for uh, uh, developers to are implementing this to go and part, uh, parse a uh, a little bit different, uh, a little bit uh, simpler time spec. But basically, to make this happen, we ended up having to put in a slightly more restrictive sy syntax as well as the ABNF in order to specify that. So mainly that was the, the reason why on this. Uh, I, I will note that as we were reviewing this, uh, we found that uh, despite the multiple reviews, we all missed the fact that all of the examples in section 8.2 uh, had a time specification that did not, uh, did not go and fit with the uh, ABNF that was specified in here. So we will be fixing that in the follow-on draft uh, of this uh, of the specification here. But we wanted to just present this and see if anyone had any uh, concerns uh, or questions with regard to the, some of the uh, design choices that were made here. Well, everyone is good. We can move on to the next slide here. So that leaves what's outstanding. So, uh, uh, so the first thing is that uh, with regard to the PCRE to pause exchange in section 7.4.1, um, unfortunately, we introduced a small little uh, uh, issue. Uh, unfortunately, uh, autocorrect got got to the best of me on this one and changed uh, locale to locate. So we will be fixing this uh, in the spe specification. It'll be a, a real simple change on that. As mentioned in the time policy uh, extension, uh, uh, what we were just talking about, uh, we'll drop the decimal seconds from all of the examples, which will go and correct that section there, section 8.2. Uh, we'll fit, uh, fix any other nits and edits as, uh, as indicated uh, uh, by others, uh, and uh, we will also be reviewing uh, Alan's changes. So in three, uh, uh, so in three, uh, three sessions from now, uh, Alan will be propo proposing a list of uh, proposed changes uh, for uh, RFC 8007, uh, uh, which we'll all be uh, taking a look at here. So I see that there's some questions from the audience over here. So. Uh, uh, I guess, uh, Rajiv, do you, uh, you appear to be first in line here. Do you have a question? Um, my question was regarding the previous slide, um, you know, where sure. we are uh, choosing not to use any uh, time zone specification as part of the timestamp. Um, have we considered uh, the effects of this um, in certain edge cases where we may be specifying certain um, times as part of triggers in time zones where there are going to be time shifts. Like, um, you know, we all wish for the day when daylight savings time is uh, no longer or, or daylight saving time changes are no longer a thing. But um, in cases where you do have a time shift, either forward or backward happening, uh, you know, and what if the time that you have specified as a, a you know, a time in the trigger uh, either gets skipped over or, you know, or maybe lands up getting hit twice and you don't have a uh, time zone specifier, which allows you to kind of uh, pin it down to a specific variant um, in that particular local time area. So how do we handle that? 
So that's a good question. Uh, so with regard to how this uh, date local time is used, uh, so uh, one of the big uh, use cases for this is to be able to go and uh, run a particular uh, 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 run a particular trigger at a specific uh, range of time. So uh, mm. if you look at the specification, there's typically a start time and an mm. end time. And the uh, uh, downstream CDN has leeway in terms of when it wants to go and schedule it within that particular time, uh, that time period right there. Mm. Uh, the idea of that was to be able to go and purge in the local time zone of wherever the cache was located right. on that. So, uh, so effectively, if we were trying to target a purge to happen during, for instance, uh, non prime time hours uh, uh, in the middle of the night in each particular region, we could end up doing that. And uh, uh, in which case, the time zone is not needed because it is whatever time zone. Uh, that is in whatever area that the cache is in in the downstream CDN on that. So uh, uh, I think so as that, you look that, at that's, this, yeah. that's the specific uh, point that I was making, that uh, what if the downstream cache or the caching node happens to be in a time zone um, that has this shift happening? And uh, one of these trigger uh, you know, boundary points is inside one of those shift points, right? Uh, Say, say, like, for example, I have an end window for a cache prefill operation, which is set to execute. Um, and the end point is happening to be inside that window of time, which is going to repeat twice. OK, do I stop my cache fill at the first occurrence or at the second occurrence of the same time point? I, so I think I, I, Nir, Nir has also joined yeah. the queue, so maybe I, I, you know, given some of the historical yeah. perspective, uh, I wonder if Nir has a, a response here. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm not fully uh, was fully uh, on board when this uh, this entire discussion was uh, uh, formulated and this extension was defined in the earliest buff uh, worked with Ori and uh, Sanjay. But I believe that based uh, aligned with uh, what uh, Jay uh, uh, explained and with uh, th those principles, uh, changing the times, uh, changing mo moving from uh, changing time zone, uh, not time zone, uh, uh, daylight saving time. Mm. If you look at it from the point of view of peak hours or low hours and things like that. Uh, it will the the usage of uh, of this time even if if it repeats mm -hmm. or uh, pass but you uh, shorten the time it aligns with it you may actually align with what the user want because mm -hmm. those are the low hours those are the peak hours the, usually the, the the changes will be uh, off in the off peak hours. Uh, I agree that there is a scent, a feeling here of of something missing, of uh, of even a, a recovery rata that may may need to be need to be addressed. Uh, uh, possibly, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can maybe specify uh, some behavior around those uh, areas, um, and we. You have to keep in mind that those extensions are all the, the the concept of extensions is that we can add more and more based on the different use cases that we want. Uh, it might be wise to, in the future, based on the needs we identify, to uh, to um, define another uh, uh, extensions that. A uh, more fits with uh, the, uh, with time zones and things like that. Uh, I, I I believe I, I, I'm fine with the I'm fine uh, with there uh, being uh, some uh, caveat here. Yeah, like you so said. Need, yeah. So I think I think that the cl clarification here would be in place. Hmm. I would not change the. I would just clarify the definition and would not change that. Okay. Uh, um. 
and, and that's it. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank, to thank Jay for uh, joining us and working so hard on those things. I really appreciate it. And it really brings this thing forward. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I entirely agree with uh, Nir that if we have just a little bit, maybe a line or two of text in here, calling out this potential edge case and um, giving some clarity to implementers, even if the clarity is as simple as um, in these kind of scenarios, it's the decision of the, uh, you know, uh, caching node uh, to decide which, you know, time point to apply and uh, just keep that in mind when... Uh, creating your triggers, that's fine. It's just that it, if you have that little sentence in there to clarify, it makes it so much easier for anyone who's looking to implement this to say, okay, that means I am I have the uh, ability to handle this and it's not an undefined area. Thank okay, you. I think it, yeah, yep. thanks. Um, in just keeping in, in mind with, with the time that we have, um, so I just moved on to the next slide. I think this is the last slide you have, um, Jay. So you want to cover this, and then we'll move on to uh, Ben. Indeed, yes. So, uh, uh, so in terms of next steps, we determined that we would create a version 12, which just has these uh, last few cleanup uh, edits on it uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the changes for the time policy extension and the uh, one small knit for uh, pos uh, the POSIX uh, re regular expressions. And uh, then we will re uh, reserve version 13 for Alan's proposed suggestions, which he'll be presenting uh, shortly about. And then hopefully at that point, once we have that uh, uh, reviewed. Uh, we'll be requesting review and uh, uh, and last call as well. So uh, and that should be it. Great, thank you, Ben. Right. You are next. As I pull up your slides. Yeah. All right. Ben. All right. All right, um, I'm going to be talking about capacity and logging. Just combine them both into one deck here because uh, capacity will be pretty short. Go to the next slide. Um, so capacity is uh, at you know at nearing the finish line here. Uh, last call was just opened, and uh, even prior to this, uh, the last revision only had a couple of nits that were fixed. Uh, so I haven't seen any substantial comments requesting major changes in quite a long time now. Um, so we'll see what happens. If you have any comments, uh, you know, uh, now's the time. And I think we'll do uh, we'll do one more revision because there was uh, I think Sanjay, you had a a couple of other comments after uh, my last revision. Um, but again, the, I think everything left is pretty minor. So uh, so that should get in. Um, if you're not familiar with capacity by now, um, please read the draft. You know, again, now's the time. Uh, the basic concept is to uh, allow the downstream to provide information to the upstream to make traffic delegation decisions based off of uh, limits around well-defined values like egress bits per second, uh, session count, and things like that, all defined in the specification, along with referencing both either an external telemetry source to provide real-time feedback on the current levels, or to include those levels in line in the advertisement. And uh, so that that's the status of capacity. Hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get this on its way soon. All right. So logging is a, a draft that we introduced. Uh, just prior to 118, I believe. Um, so even though it, it's a, a new introduction, it's something that's been worked on for quite a while. So there's a whole long list of people that have been working on this thing for well over a year now. And uh, I think it's finally gotten to a state where uh, it's cohesive. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about all the things in this list here as we go through the slides in a little more detail. Um, but the basic concept is that the existing CDNI logging specification in 7937 only provides a, um, 
a single uh, way to build log files. It's a uh, an ELF derived format um, with a, a, a sparse list of fields. And uh, the only way to, to retrieve it is via references from an atom-based index uh, with no explicit transport mechanisms. Um, so this draft addresses all of those gaps and, uh, and adds some additional things, as you'll see. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first thing that we tackled was the, the set of fields that we want to cover. And right now, this draft specifically addresses access log fields on uh, edge cache nodes. Um, you know, there are, it's possible that logging could cover other use cases, such as intermediary caching, um, uh, origin requests, or potentially other services as well. Right now, it's focused on edge caches. Um, there have been only a couple of changes in the field definitions from the previous draft that I uploaded. And those are there, um, but this this set of fields was uh, arrived at uh, via a long process with the participation of I think twelve or thirteen different uh, companies that are heavily active in the CDN space, um, and it was a, a back and forth until we narrowed it down to the current list. So there's a lot of overlap with seventy nine thirty seven. There's also a lot of new fields, and they're organized into uh, a, a, into three different groupings with a minimal standard and extended set to cover uh, different use cases. Um, next slide, please. Um, so to expand upon the, the one format specified in 7937, we've added a whole new slate of things, um, including uh, JSON, CSV, white space, and protobuf, as you can see here. Um, this we've we've kind of created a separation between the format of the uh, individual records that go into an access log and the format of the overall file, which we call a container. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. You'll see that JSON is again this list um, because you could have a JSON container, you know, uh, with a bunch of metadata surrounding an array that contains. Uh, log entries that are also JSON objects. Or you could have a JSON container with log entries that are in a CSV string format, for example. Um, so it's kind of a, a mix and match to cover all the use cases. Um, in addition to just the raw uh, file formats, we also wanted to support uh, tarballs. So uh, you can also group log files into archives. At this point, tar is the only supported format um, that could be extended. Um, but uh, you know, rather than treating files as individually, we can also package them together. Uh, next slide, please. So once you have a file, um, you don't necessarily know what that file covers or what transformations have been applied to that file. Because if you were to pull back the instantaneous advertisement uh, from the downstream that says, you know, here's the uh, here's the FCI object specifying the logging configuration. That's only a, a point in time response. So you know this is what the configuration is right now. That doesn't really help you if you are looking at historical log files. So we've introduced this concept of container metadata, which covers all of that information packaged alongside the the logs themselves. So in the case of a JSON container, that can be inside of the log file. For other formats, you can have a separate JSON file that lives alongside the log file with all of this information. Um, and this you know, would allow you to decode the individual log records. Uh, next slide, please. So we had this question of, uh, you know, now you've produced all these log files, how do you get them to their destination? So 7937 says, look at the atom index and follow those references and retrieve them. Uh, it doesn't also doesn't really tell you how do you get to the index in the first place, which is a, a small gap. Um, but that's not really sufficient for, uh, you know, current modern pr production CDN use cases. So we've divided these uh, these transport mechanisms into two different modes. One is pull, 
so in addition to 7937, uh, we can also support SFTP and S S3. And if you go to the next slide, please. There's also a push mode. So the DCDN can deliver the logs to an upstream endpoint. Uh, so to do that, the upstream needs to uh, specify the details of where those logs should be pushed. And that's where we come to a bunch of new MI objects to support that. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So here's just a, a simple example of an upstream telling the downstream to push logs to an S3 bucket. Uh, and you'll see this is also making use of another draft that was recently adopt adopted by the working group for protected secret metadata um, for that access key secret. So uh, just a couple other features that are, are shown here in this little example, uh, things like the name template, which allows the upstream to specify how the log should be named, and the interval, which defines over you know, what time period uh, a log should cover before rolling over to a, to a new one. Uh, it can get a bit more complicated than that, but that's what the specification is for. Um, next slide, please. So one of the other things we had to think about was uh, we have all this data in the logs, and a lot of it can be considered sensitive in some way or another. Um, things like PII uh, might need to be obfuscated for regulatory reasons. Other things uh, might need to be obfuscated because they're sensitive to your particular implementation, things like encryption keys. Uh, so we've provided a set of transform operations that you can use to uh, redact sensitive information or protect it in uh, various ways. So you can remove things from URLs, you can truncate strings, you can do a regex search replace against the string, you can uh, do IP masking, both for v4 and v6, um, you know, or you can uh, encrypt the field and uh, uh, you know, provide that that encryption key via the protected secrets metadata. Um, yeah, so uh, if we go to the next slide, this is the last one. Um, so I, I feel that this draft is in a pretty good place right now. So I'm asking for working group adoption of the draft. It obviously is pretty big and needs a lot of feedback. And I haven't seen any comments about it so far since I brought it uh, to the last IETF. So I'm hoping we'll uh, we'll get some participation now uh, on the list, uh, even though I know a lot of people on this call have already worked on this draft outside of this working group. Um, and there is, a, there is a bunch of other stuff that the draft doesn't cover right now, um, which doesn't necessarily need to be addressed as part of this draft specifically, could be an additional extension to cover this other functionality. Um, but you know things like filtering and sampling uh, are just something that that uh, we didn't get to yet because the scope is already pretty large. Um, so I'll I'll leave that uh, there for if anyone has questions if they want to get into the the queue or uh, I'll leave it to uh, Kevin Sanjay and Chris if you can maybe elaborate on how we proceed here from uh, the you know my request for working group adoption. Um, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so yes, uh, this draft was submitted back in 118, um, and uh, chairs have been just overwhelmed with a lot of documents that are coming in, and we have not done a good job of trying to stay on top of each of these documents. There's there's a lot of work actually, but uh, the long and short, uh, this document seems like it's within the within the bounds of CDNI. Um, I'll certainly read this, um, and I think. I don't see a problem in, in getting this uh, document adopted as a working group uh, um, draft. Yeah, I think um, we, we do need more discussion. We do need more reviewers. Um, if we could, if, if folks could please go and read the draft and, and post your comments to the list, that would be helpful. Um, I, I agree that the content makes sense to, to adopt. Um, I think we just need to, to make sure that we have the, the support for it. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Well, that's it for me then. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Um, next is Ellen. 
Let's see here. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the presentation will talk about uh, proposed uh, scope. So it's not something that is uh, kind of necessarily has been defined at uh, uh, this presentation certainly doesn't talk about every uh, kind of um, uh, kind of detail uh, that uh, I'm proposing to, to introduce to the draft, uh, but more kind of speaks about future scope and also I think to solace at feedback and awareness. So uh, um, I can go to the next slide. So, and as Jay said, uh, the plan is, uh, I guess the tentative plan is actually to introduce this into uh, uh, kind of subsequent drafts. I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that makes really to quickly separate V12 or V13 or just work uh, together on v, kind of V12 or V13, or, but we, we can figure this out, what, what the best way to move it forward. Uh, the motivation for this proposed scope, right, comes from, uh, and I mentioned in this forum before, uh, coming stems from the cash management interface work that uh, we uh, have carried on in uh, SVTA for the last two years. And that has been sort of, uh, within SVTA, this body of work is come, coming to kind of uh, ratification. Uh, out of that, and this interface, uh, heavily relies on and extends CATEV2 um, uh, framework. Uh, so uh, the uh, reason for introducing this, those changes now are that there are several core features that uh, kind of we think that belong in the core spec uh, as opposed to others. Kind of subsequently we'll be introducing additional drafts that uh, can be separate because they uh, utilize uh, the um, uh, extensions mechanism introduced in CATV2 draft. So we don't have to introduce all extensions in, in the current draft. We can actually uh, submit them separately where it makes sense. But some core functionality uh, kind of does need to be addressed uh, in, in the spec itself, in the draft. So uh, hence uh, these proposals. Uh, additional driver is that uh, kind of, again, CDNI and open caching don't necessarily are one and same. So the goal is to achieve interoperability between the two frameworks. So some of the concepts that uh, were kind of have been long addressed within CDNI actually are not addressed in open caching. Uh, so we're looking at several way, several minor points, I think, that uh, currently are uh, featuring as mandatory within uh, the draft and maybe within open caching uh, and now open caching derived implementations don't have to be necessarily. So that there is that issue and I'll, I'll talk about that in the later slide. And last but not least, uh, the goal of the cache management interface effort is to convert that interface into workable uh, open, API, open API RESTful schema and that drives some proposals that uh, in, in, in the scope that uh, uh, will allow us to streamline uh, the spec and also make it more restful. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, I'll go through the list of topics. Uh, so there's, I think, about six, seven issues that uh, we want to introduce in that, in the, in that kind of major draft update. Uh, so first is object list, right? So, so uh, the current draft addresses very rightfully so support for content playlist spec, right? So which is ability for UCDN uh, to use existing uh, manifests as a way to, to kind of drive cache management operation. Because cache management is all about efficiency and then stream, streamlined uh, ops and just uh, creating list of URLs where manifest exists is, is really a useful thing. So we want to take that further to, to address not just video content formats that there today, because right now it supports HLS, Dash, and uh, Smooth, uh, but that doesn't cover necessarily uh, content that is not fully video or a mix of video, non-video content. For example, there are some uh, formats in use in the industry that include manifests plus some non-video formats at uh, video files that are related, for example, thumbnails or subtitles. So we want to have a way to kind of basically uh, to feed into DCD, DCDN those more complex uh, file structures that are not necessarily are built in, in uh, 
in the video uh, manifest uh, format and then allow UCDN to actually use existing uh, kind of uh, descriptors, right, of, of this. And um, additionally, and, and do that at least in two different ways, different formats is JSON and plain text. Plain text, which is like a list of URLs line by line, and JSON uh, will enable us to ex actually include some of the metadata objects in the list as well. So if I'm feeding, for example, the use case for that is I'm feeding very large list of files, and I want to create some policy extensions that apply to only some of the objects in the same trigger, the JSON format will allow me to do that. There's been sort of in our group, and there have been some advocacy for 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 such extension. Uh, we could we should examine also additional formats that would be kind of generic uh, uh, format languages. So XML and um, and YAML should be also considered. So if you kind of if you have ready files that list files that describe a list of files, you should be able to use them. I think that, uh, but we need to see uh, kind of uh, kind of where to get right now. Uh, CDNI metadata objects are serialized in JSON only. So I would certainly uh, would look to JSON as a method for serialization of metadata objects here. Um, that's kind of left side of the slide. The right side is kind of, so that's kind of uh, uh, feeding uh, object list to D DCDN, right? The UCDN can take existing um, uh, this kind of lists of objects and feed them. Uh, but then, right, which is a great simplification, it simplifies processes, makes life easier, kind of, uh, and so on, uh, but also makes life also complex for, for troubleshooting, because or you gave me, hey, you use UCDN, you gave me a list of files, a manifest, which could be updated, could be different versioning of that. Uh, I went in and as DCDN processed them, and some of that and so minimally, I need to be able to, to report back and said, you gave me a manifest. This is a list of objects I derived. Is it what you meant? Right? So we can kind of look at versioning and look at kind of if that was the intention, if that was the correct version. Uh, also, um, and then we can use a JSON format to do that. So that's kind of ability to, to kind of trade a uh, structured list of objects in, in, in this uh, between UCDN and DCDN uh, look like natural um, kind of extension of that playlist support that is currently in the draft today. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, additionally, kind of one major top, top, uh, topic came up as we were discussing kind of how to use uh, kind of triggers for, for task completion and execution, which is what triggers really describes this kind of queuing process and uh, job management. Uh, one thing was kind of seemed like lacking is that right now uh, there's really kind of uh, hand waving around uh, the way uh, DCDN should process triggers. Kind of there, there are some limits that are there, sort of the the time policy, kind of when the process should at least start and it should complete by a certain time, optionally. But kind of how triggers are chosen for execution, in which order. Are they processed and acted upon immediately or can be done in batch? This is all kind of really used up for the area right now. So this is one area that kind of we want to address in an extension, but we think it's in a core extension, sort of like a time policy, which will address uh, rules and provide UCDN more options to control that. So control, it can control uh, trigger processing in more detail, kind of order of execution, which comes first, which comes second, dependency, do this, then do that, uh, concurrency, and so on. Um, that's first. And secondary, also, if we are looking at really doing that at scale, if we are looking at a potential dealing with not one, two, three triggers, but maybe dozens or hundreds of them, there should be better tool set for monitoring processing. And right now, the, uh, there's something called trigger status collection that's kind of not really provides for a very easy way to, to monitor statues. Kind of, you have to basically what you get is one API call, which returns a list of URLs and you need to go and kind of iterate by one on one, kind of, if you have two, you don't mind, but if you have 50, that's already kind of not what you want as, as kind of as really a job kind of uh, queue, queuing and monitoring uh, support in the interface. 
so those are the needs. Now I'll, I'll talk about kind of how we want to address that. Next slide. So our first use case is priority, right? So, so that uh, we want to enable UCDN to say uh, on which uh, which priority trigger should be uh, processed and uh, to not kind of to disallow it be used also provide very simple kind of priority mechanism. So like integer from one to 100, to not to kind of create, to, to, to split too many triggers when you can help it. Uh, use cases are like urgent trigger, like you you have sets of triggers in motion and something very urgent comes, comes you want it to be next kind of, uh, and kind of uh, uh, come ahead in the line, like urgent purge and validation. You should be able to set like a lower priority or higher priority in the queue and that gets picked up next. Uh, or uh, actually intentional staggering of triggers. So you put positioning triggers and you want to kind of indicate more urgent kind of content first than others. So priorities, I think, pretty straightforward. Uh, next slide. Um, then uh, similarly, uh, priority is good, but that's sort of not enough because in terms of it's, it defines what gets picked up next, but doesn't say when. So maybe next can be like, for example, DCDN can implement a batch processing. Like, hey, I'm doing purges, but I'm doing that at midnight. Kind of come talk to me in 12 hours. And that's urgent, has to be done now. And if not, UCDN wants to hear about it. So uh, a proposed extension, kind of, again, a part of the one extension that uh, we have specified that will come in the draft called execution policy extension, will say, hey, this is high priority and also do it right away. If you can't, fail it. So I'll know that it's not happening. Um, so uh, and that can happen for, for example, maybe you said it's urgent, but you did you provided dependencies, or there may be a conflict with different attributes. There's a number of reasons why it can be denied, but certainly that's an explicit ask, which should be explicitly approved or denied by DCDM. Like do it right away. Uh, next slide. Uh, and dependency, right? So, so that's a third uh, and last kind of uh, sort of kind of uh, pillar of this of this extension. Uh, it's a ability to basically define a dependency uh, between triggers, um, and uh, so that the trigger is only processed goes into active state uh, after uh, the other tr triggers it depends on have been processed in full. Process in full can be one of three things. Like so, it's kind of in the nearest term, I love that it's called terminal state, right? It's sort of, it's no longer pending or active. It's either complete, success, failed, uh, failed, or, or it got canceled. So it's no longer executing. Whenever that's reached, then the dependent triggers can start. And use cases are kind of there, but I'm sure there are additional ones. So purge content and preposition a new one, but don't preposition before purge is complete. So you don't actually, uh, don't, don't, don't create a collision. Uh, cancel preposition and retry it only after it has been canceled because cancellation can be asynchronous. So I want to know when it's really complete, only then I want to retry. Uh, and, and, and chaining, right? The same is that like priority, but also uh, only do this after you've done that. Um, next slide. Um, now, uh, one, to, one uh, uh, enhancement that came out of this and that will allow us actually to, to help monitoring and also provide better tools with managing, again, large number of triggers, because I think that, that what we're seeking to do is that uh, is providing better tools for monitoring. And I mentioned today the API is, uh, interface is really just a list of URLs that you need to go and pull. Uh, and there is no way to actually separate them. For example, if you are UCDN, and you have separate triggers that are unrelated, you don't have a way to actually manage that. And unrelated can be that you have triggers that deal with a particular set of content. So you want to separate, I don't know, video from audio, for example, or, or it can be also, let's say, if, uh, the different content publishers or different, different areas of content that are completely unrelated. So I want to be able to mark and deal with them separately to create triggers and also monitoring them. Um, uh, and that's, that's one drive. And another is that we can provide an easy way to look at the trigger without looking at all of it. The triggers with extensions have become very complex objects because that's kind of just a spec and action and what you do and an extension, you large object. So if I want just to look abbreviated way 
of uh, kind of quickly, what is my queue and what's happening in there? What's priority? What is the things we, I just spoke about? So a label provides a good way to do this. It's kind of uh, ability to, uh, first of all, mark the trigger. So as you create a trigger, you actually label that. So I, can, I wanna create a label, a trigger for video. So then I can look at all my video triggers or whatever my grouping happens to be. Maybe a publisher, maybe a project. So whatever is subset. So I can then filter triggers, not just by state as it done today, but also by label, right? And also a uh, label would be at the trigger spec. So a trigger level, so I can actually label a trigger. And I can also extend, every extension can also provide a set of uh, labels that would be exposed. So let's say extension sets priority. So I can provide priority as key value label that can be easily seen uh, at, at the trigger level. So I'm looking at the trigger, I'll see it's video and it's priority is 100. So then I can make easily in, and that can done be one in one API call as opposed to iterating through a list. So UCDN gets a, gets a statues, see what happens and can make decisions on what to do next. Introduce a new one, kind of trigger, kind of cancel, do all the things that, that needs to be done with jobs. Um, next slide. Um, that's a minor one, but kind of important. Uh, so uh, today, uh, uh, there are in the triggers, there are several ways you can actually uh, specify uh, uh, kind of the called uh, trigger spec. And there are several types. All but one really use URL in some form. Is it a, a kind of list of URL? Is it a regular expression? Is that a, a playlist, right? But their use of URLs is very happy. And that's natural. The only, the only spec that is not using URL is uh, CCID, is content uh, category identifier. Uh, the, the wrinkle here is that uh, DCDN and UCDN may use two different types of URL, at least that's what we see today. One is a published URL and the other is cached URL. Published URL implies, and that should be the default, right? It implies that uh, for whenever trigger is accepted for a particular URL, it has to match published configuration. And we have to say it, I don't think it says today. So if, for example, if um, if you ask a preposition object for publish URL for that you didn't publish, that should be an error, right? Additionally, when that's a published URL, uh, that should invoke triggering of related metadata objects. So whatever it needs to be kind of, uh, whatever DCDN needs to do when acquiring content from the origin. So similarly, if I'm prepositioning, I'm going through the origin and I need some kind of uh, uh, authorization I should be able to, to use what's already there. So um, unless uh, we are saying that this is a published, uh, this is a cache key URL, then all of that logic should not, uh, should not apply. So the proposal is to add uh, an attribute to these trigger specs of new URL and to indicate which URL type is, um, uh, is uh, implied and default being published. So, and that means the things that I just mentioned. So you actually check configuration that you can actually satisfy the trigger. Uh, and if not, if cache key, then those, those rules uh, do not uh, apply. Uh, Kevin, I see your hand. Do you want to raise it now or do the yeah, I I want to I want to mention that we're over time for this topic already. Uh, I know you're only you're only halfway through the slides. Um, you, you have 10 extra minutes to talk about the footprints draft. You, you can keep going but I just wanted to give you that time check um, that we're running behind. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, so um, let, let me, uh, I think we're heading towards end here. So um, kind of, uh, and that next slide. Uh, RESTful API, important, important change. Again, I'm gonna, and again, this is just scope. So again, we don't have to cover every detail here. There will be a draft coming up. We will we'll have it, everything inside. But we uh, want to streamline uh, the use of REST in a way that uh, will obviate the need in two different commands. Today, there are two different commands in the, in the draft for cancellation and creation using kind of uh, post and some JSON. Instead of that, uh, we've come up with a way to actually uh, use RESTful semantics. And uh, uh, cancellation would be done to, to update our field called desire state. And is this way uh, a trigger can be created as desired state pending. So here is a trigger, don't process it yet. 
I put it in pending. I'll tell you when I actually want to activate that. Uh, complete, I want it to run. So it's kind of fully active trigger or cancel, which means that kind of I want to cancel, uh, cancel the trigger. And then uh, when it's in terminal state, uh, we can use delete as today. So this will LA enable us really to use uh, standard RESTful semantics. I think there's some difference of opinion. Should we use post for changing of triggers or patch and update? But I think that that's, that's secondary. Because the, the idea is that really align the triggers fully uh, with rest, RESTful semantics. Um, next slide. Uh, kind of, uh, that's important. Uh, uh, CIT triggers today uh, kind of sees monolithic use of triggers for both content uh, and metadata. In reality, we have two different interfaces dealing with, with one with configuration and metadata, another with, with content. Uh, the clash is in FCI. FCI kind of right now publishes capabilities uh, for, for triggers for both. Uh, we need to have a way to actually in FCI split it and say, Hey, for uh, trigger subject uh, metadata, use this endpoint, and it, it will support these versions: v1, v2, uh, kind of or both. And for content, use the different endpoint, which the cache management interface that will support this version. And there, there is a proposal to deal with that in FCI. Uh, next, and a CDM path. That's that's a big topic. I think we we got some discussion on the list, so I'm not gonna kind of make too much of that. Uh, kind of right now, uh, the, the draft mandates use of CDN, CDN uh, identifiers, uh, which are kind of right now, the only way it's done, it, it's using uh, ASN numbers, which is really not good way to identify CDNs in, 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 you know, uh, in the wild anymore. Uh, so we need to, proposal is to A, make it optional, so we don't actually force implementers just feed uh, bogus data and B, come up with a better way to identify CDNs and probably uh, come up with some, some method that will provide different multiple methods. So maybe there is identifier provider and some, and maybe there is a simpler method, but the thing we need basically, it, it, it needs work. And I'm not sure if actually that's work that has to be in the triggers or triggers should really kind of reference uh, some other effort that will address that because we also need it for security, uh, security and, and authentication and credential management. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so that was uh, that was triggers, right? And again, pr proposed scope, uh, the follow up, and this to actually put it in writing and specify all these things, and uh, kind of. Uh, uh, I want to cover name footprints, and I know that I'm, I'm short on time, but actually that would be quick. So. Um, Sanjay? Yeah, just one quick question um, on the on what you've covered so far. Um, for the UCDN to be able to specify uh, priorities on uh, managing the queue, the question is that what for any reason the, the DCDN is is not able to honor honor that. So is there a way for DCDN to simply deny the request? First and foremost, so, so the answer is twofold. First, uh, the support, that's part of us, uh, the uh, extension that are supported should be part of FCI. We are today, right? So if, if this extension, execution policy extension is not supported in full, so there is no kind of, uh, uh, no support whatsoever. So that will be denied because it will be actually not advertised. Uh, subsequently also, I think there is a way for, uh, there is actual return code that enables uh, DCDN to, to refuse uh, refuse not supported uh, uh, subfield. So, you, for example, you support uh, dependency, but you don't support priority. And there is no way to say it fully in FCI, not to split, split the hairs too much. You can just deny a request and say, hey, not supported. OK, so let's talk about footprints quickly. Kevin? Um, I'd like to ask one, one question as well. This is uh, more from a chair perspective. So. Alan, you're going to work with Jay to talk about whether or not we can incorporate these. Um, do you guys have a timeline for for when you're going to have that discussion, or or you know when we can make a decision on whether we should move forward with the current set of changes in the 807 bis, or whether we want to wait for these additional changes? I'm not opposed necessarily to the things that you've proposed, but I think it 
does imply we're going to have a, a bit more work to do on the draft. Jane, you're kind of what we'll kind of please change. Yeah, uh, uh, there, are, there, are several, there are several things that are in the, as Alan says, there are several that are in the core of the implementation, like the desired states, for example. Uh, for extensions, we will need to choose a pair extension, whether it's in this draft or not. Uh, also for uh, the content playlist, the additions, also there we have FCI to support us, so, so we don't have to push everything at once. Uh, we will, I think we should aim to get uh, something, by, something cl relatively closed uh, for the next uh, ITF meeting. Uh, but this is, as I won't be the one that pushing it forward, I, I cannot uh, commit and sign any checks <laughs> on behalf of uh, Alan, and that did a great job here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, MJ. So, so are we thinking that we will have a proposal at IETF 120 um, as to how to move forward, as not necessarily a, a proposed text, a proposed draft, but a proposed plan? I think we should be able to get it into draft. Again, this is uh, derived, it's uh, the, uh, ba the spec is based upon, it's really it's detailed and written up. So we should not take a lot of time actually to convert that into into uh, uh, into draft. And I would even propose not to stagger necessarily V12 and V13, but maybe look at this, uh, look at the scope going to the next draft altogether. We already have some uh, significant dis discussion of that. Ellen didn't get into all the details because the time limits. So, and I think I'm, I think the I'm okay with wise. supporting the draft on this. So, but yeah, go ahead. Thanks. I, yeah, the only thing I would add is that timeline-wise, um, it would really be best to try to to narrow down uh, to basically come to the consensus of what would go in version 13. That should happen <coughs> soon, um, rather, I mean sooner rather than later. Um, and in fact, if there is an agreement, then uh, a new draft should be submitted well before IETF 120. And then hopefully we, we're really looking at working group last call and that kind of stuff towards 120. So I think it probably behooves upon us to try and get this done in the next couple of months to have a good draft ready, in, ready for reviews. I think it's feasible. Um, yeah, that's, uh, again, we've done at least three, four reviews already, so that's that's uh, scope well established. But I think it, you know, that that uh, within a couple of months we can have the draft. Sounds good. We're looking forward to seeing the draft. Thank you. Um, I'll be really yeah. quick on footprints because it's really a recall. Of, uh, kind of, Glenn, I see your hand, so, so uh, let me just kind of do minimal justice to the footprints. We spend all this time talking about triggers. Um, oh yeah, well, I, I actually wanted to talk about triggers for a second. Just so okay. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. As we do get into the next round of work in the SVTA on what we're calling the orchestration API, you know, you touched on it a little bit. We will rely on triggers for asynchronous notification to a UCDN can know when it's published metadata to a DCDN. It's conceivable as we flesh that out, we may want to pile on some more minor changes or extensions to triggers. I know you've already thought about it a bunch, uh, but just, you know, that's out there and that may be, not be work that we get to for a few more months. So we'll have to see how the timing of all of, all of this is, but it's conceivable we may want to change a few things. Uh, just uh, really to worry than that, uh, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm aware and actually reach out to you actually to, to make sure that you pull you in on this uh kind of we have a mechanism of extensions that we can actually uh, rely on for example one of the things that are kind of beyond this draft is actual webhook support to actually we get real updates asynchronously when something is complete because you don't have that today but that's something we can actually work on in a separate draft as basically using the existing framework that uh near put in place around extensions so you can actually extend things and get get rich uh, functionality without changing the core. What we're trying to do now is what we really have to do in the core that cannot go into an extension. Sounds good. Yeah, um, and I think I think as chairs, we would encourage you that we don't want to drag this on for, for months and months and months. So 
what we really, if you can focus in on what we really need in the core, that would be great. Thanks. Um, so uh, name footprints, the topic that I, so that's, that's a, a second uh, uh, go of the same draft, kind of the previous draft, I think didn't get enough uh, attention from the group and got expired. Nir uh, gave me very useful comments and submits on, on, on the syntax. So I submitted a new draft before ITF 119. Uh, kind of, again, that's a recap of what we already discussed. Uh, there is a need for uh, more advanced footprint capabilities. Uh, going forward also, I think that's a tool set that we'd like to build and use for any form of sub-CDN slicing. So things like do something within CDN, but only uh, in some region and geography, because for example, triggers have location policy, which is not using footprints. So my thinking is that footprints would become this tool, tool that everything would rely on kind of for any sub-CDN functionality. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to cover all these use cases been presented, kind of why we need that. Just want to talk about what's new in the, in, in the draft um, and what's actually lacking, what, what needs to happen in the next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, in the scope, uh, again, we are kind of introducing ERQ footprints. Uh, so you can create kind of footprints and sub footprints and so on. Uh, and allow clients to cache footprint objects. So that's something that uh, UCDN can actually cache footprint definition, then kind of basically become a separate, a separate and addressable referenceable object that's separate from uh, capabilities, because FCI is capabilities and footprints, but footprints is actually kind of uh, today's secondary citizen. So uh, that will change that. Uh, and add uh, two, two types. One will be just a footprint that's named so kind of uh, use this footprint that defined elsewhere, that, that's a proposal, and also use of uh, metadata expression language for footprint definition, which could be expression footprint. We can help define more complex expressions uh, with more Booleans, Boolean expressions and so on. Uh, that was all the initial uh, draft, there was no change really. What's new in the current draft and the update? Next slide. Uh, so uh, there's syntax fixes. So you near pointed some some kind of uh, obvious errors because like use of arrays was there in the text but not not in the examples. Um, additional thing that that uh, happened there that it's uh, the new object that we're proposing is a footprint source uh, to be better able to be able better define the definition of footprint where it comes from. When you say uh, when you say uh, certain geography according to who there's different uh, providers in the market for providing of geolocation information so you can actually reference that and provide that um, uh, in a structured way because today, today we're kind of implying that when you say us it's everybody agrees on what it is in reality there are different definitions of what geography could be or even subcode so we, it's important to ind indicate kind of uh, what, what is the reference uh, uh, reference uh, source uh, and uh, a new thing that came out of this is support for um, something called self-published geo feeds. A real problem that exists in the market is that kind of access provider uh, will see its own information uh, reported incorrectly and will want to actually correct that and say, well, these IP addresses are really in kind of in, uh, are in US, kind of they're not kind of maybe uh, MaxMind doesn't think so, but there's correct information. So its ability uh, with this will be an option for DCDN that happens to be an access provider to also self-publish your information, refer that in a footprint. So kind of it you know, footprint is this geography according to this definition that I also happen to have published. It also happens to be a standard for that, uh, 8805. Um, so uh, I think that's kind of very straightforward use case uh, for this. So that's a change again, 90% uh, of the text is the same. Uh, I think there was a discussion about uh, a pushback on a year ago about this being maybe uh, kind of uh, similar to Alto. Um, this is the next slide and the last one. Uh, just very quickly, the footprints are not Alto. They, they kind of not, it's not one and the same. Uh, Alto is, is a way to address and, and for access providers to, to, to publish their own network topology. Uh, footprints are a way for DCDN to indicate which geographies does it cover. 
uh, and kind of and has uh, has coverage for and, and uh, so they are really uh, complementary. So I don't think that I think it is something that is within uh, CDNI scope. Uh, but happy to have more discussion when you have more time on the list. Uh, again, asking for kind of second time asking for a working group adoption. I think it's a pretty fundamental tool that actually a dif different uh, additional work uh, in our space relies on having this. Uh, so um, this is the yes. And that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And I think we're going to move on to you, Glenn. You've got a full set of slides here. Um, let me bring that up. Yeah, you just go right to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, several of my co-authors neglected to register in time for IETF 119. Um, I actually almost oopsed on that and registered yesterday and got in. So um, while I'm sort of the editor and uh, uh, shepherder of, of, of this pile of work. Um, I can't necessarily speak to all of it. So uh, some questions may have to defer to the uh, list. And we're not going to go into too much detail on all of these. Basically, this work here represents a set of uh, configuration metadata, you know, generally extensions to RFC 806 that we've been working on for several years now within SVTA. This whole pile of work um, is about to be published through the SVTA. And it will be called Configuration Interface 2.0. We've broken it up into pieces here to move through uh, CDNI. Um, and now all the pieces are in place. You can see the new ones here uh, for, for this IETF. So we'll go through one by one and talk about all of these. But four of them are brand new, the ones labeled uh, new individual drafts. So we'll kind of go through these one by one. So next slide. Great. So the metadata expression language um, just one minor change since the last draft, just a clarification of some wording. Um, this still needs uh, review and feedback from CDNI uh, working group members. Like the entire set, it's all been reviewed many times within SVTA, but we certainly want to get some non-SVTA eyeballs on there. And I think based on a follow-up we had with um, Sanjay and Kevin uh, within the last few months, um, it was determined this, in fact, can and should be within CDNI and can stay here. In fact, it's not only foundational for uh, many of the other drafts in this family of documents, it will be used. I think um, Alan had mentioned in the name footprints, he has some desires to use it. I think within the logging interface, we want to use it as well. So we want to move to adopt this as a working group draft and get some eyeballs on it. Um, next. Okay, uh, processing stages metadata. Um, since the last draft, the same thing came up um, with um, Sanjay and Kevin. You know, that we were questioned whether or not this can or should stay within CDNI, and we determined determined that it should. On the next slide, I'll get to into a second. We did some updates on a diagram that Sanjay and uh, Kevin had requested. Um, since the last draft really um, a series of minor changes, clarifications that I've listed out here. And this is all that was posted within the working group uh, documentation as well. Um, I won't get too much into that, but like um, all the others, we'd like to get some non SVTA eyeballs on this and also move to adopt it as a working group draft. Uh, there is one more slide here. Let's go to the next slide because this is worth talking about. Yeah, so um, Sanjay, we, we discussed this within the SVTA, and I think at what you guys had said that the box in the middle should be labeled TCDN for transit CDN. Um, that's not really the spirit of what this thing is doing. Really, in CDNI vocabulary, client really is, in this case, typically like a video player. It really is the client. The downstream CDN is this guy in the middle doing the, the edge caching and then the upstream CDN, what we call source or origin is really the function of an upstream CDN, uh, just as source is defined already in 8006. So we just kind of added that clarification in here. Is that, uh, uh, Kevin and, and Sanjay, if you wanted to comment on that, does that meet your requirement? 
Um, yes, yes, I think it, it's it's fine as to how you described it, and in the spirit of you know the separation as you have here, um, client is just a video player. So um, I think that the the important point here was that in order for this to be really uh, part of the CDNI specification, we wanted to make sure that there's indeed you know interconnections between the DCDN and UCDN, and that some processing is is doing which exactly you know falls into the interconnection bucket that was the yeah the yeah the original version of the diagram did not have dcdn and ucdn labels on there and so i think this should help clarify it in the cdni context i i agree i think that's okay i, I do think that more generically um it could still be a tcd and it could be a transit cdn and you could still apply transforms and, and it would work right but, yes um, true true for the, for the purposes of the, this discussion i think that's fine though thanks Good. Okay. So um, I said, like the others, we want to move this one. We feel now is ready to move to working group uh, uh, adoption. Next one. Okay. This has uh, received thorough review. Um, really, um, nothing has changed. Uh, oh, just a, again, a minor clarification since the last draft, nothing's of, of significance. So this one, we would like to get moved to working group last call. I think and the intro to all of the Sanjay, this was one of the ones on your list also uh, to go to last call. So I think we're in agreement on that. Nothing new. We like that. Next. Okay, this is a big new draft. Um, Pankaj uh, Chandra from Hulu Disney uh, submitted this. I did some of the work on it. I'm a co-author. Uh, Pankaj couldn't join us, so I'll sort of speak to this a little bit. This basically takes um, source metadata um, from 8006 and greatly extends it with a whole suite of additions that is easier for me to speak to on the next slide. So let's go to that and I can talk to some of these additions. Good. So we have two data models here we're showing. The purple one is the relatively simple um, data model that was in RFC 8006. We have source metadata, uh, which is just a list of sources. And then each source very simply just had a list of endpoints, you know, to, to reach upstream and grab a source from an authentication method and a protocol. That was it. What we've now uh, created the source metadata extended, which has all the same properties that source had, but it's got many, many additions. There's additions to do a load balance here in the lower left corner of the uh, slide. Um, where you can specify a load balancing algorithm to balance between multiple origins. There's a mechanism what we call source detention, where you can do health checks and put sick origin endpoints into detention for a period of time where you don't hit them again until um, they, they measure healthy. And um, there are several extensions in here beyond the basic metadata that allow you to specify things that we see typically in commercial CDN configurations, origin host names, web routes, uh, indications about whether redirects should be followed, um, a whole suite of source connection control algorithms and MI source connection control in and of itself has lots of settings about, you know, how to deal with timeouts and fail and failures from, from sources. Um, so this one, again has got extensive review and feedback within svta but we very very much would like uh, to get um non-svta eyeballs on this one next client access control this is another new uh, draft also uh pankaj from hulu was the, the main author several others of us contributed on this um this one does let me just look at my notes briefly give me a second here yeah, this has got some extended rules from RC806, for example, had location, ACL, and time window ACL. We've extended those here to allow you to use some of the rich capabilities we've specified in the processing stages, where uh, if you deny, for example, for an ACL, you can now specify a synthetic response to come back. Very common CDN use case. So there's some minor extensions there. Um, there is some um, ability to specify what certificates and encryption levels are required for, for a client to access the content. And the thing I wanted to just talk about here real quick is the new protocol types. 
So RFC 8006 called for two protocol types, HTTP 1.1 and HTTPS 1.1. It was a happy world when all of, that was all that existed. Um, we now need, you know, ways to talk about H2 and H3. So because there was no real standard on this, people have already taken it upon themselves to use a few different naming conventions. So what we put in here in the um, request for um, IANA entries, oh, and by the way, since we posted this up, um, Kevin, I'm sure you're familiar with this. It was new to me. In a, the IANA operations manager very quickly hopped on some wording they didn't like and how we proposed these new registry entries. And they suggest, suggested some minor wording changes. And so we, I went ahead and did that and resubmitted the draft, I think, yesterday. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about this now, if there's any comments on this. Um, H2, we're, we're, uh, requesting that it can be referred to as HTTP slash two, HTTPS slash two, or simply H2. Same for H3, uh, HTTP slash H3 doesn't really make any sense since it's HTTPS only. Um, so we've put this in as part of the document requesting these protocol types. Any comments or questions on that? Or does that seem reasonable? I just wanted to get it out there that we're doing that. I think it seems reasonable. Good. That's easy. And then just one other comment, uh, in the client access control metadata, we have defined uh, tentatively, but we've set it aside for now, an MI object to configure the uh, cat, the common access token that Chris Lemons is helping drive through uh, in, in CTA wave. Um, and when that um, doc gets a little further along in CTA wave, certainly when it gets a doc number over there, we'll go ahead and add that object in into a future draft of client access control metadata. Um, so we'd like, you know, we'd like this to be accepted as a working group draft as well, this brand new draft. Next. Okay, edge control metadata, love it, zero updates since IETF 118. This thing has been sitting around for a while. I think I may have, I'm not even sure. I don't think I did resubmit it, um, although it may expire at some point. This also was on the list that Sanjay and Kevin presented up top uh, to be moved to working group last call. This thing's been pretty stable for a while. Did receive a uh, thorough review and feedback from Kevin a while back. Next. Okay, another new draft. Um, this one is a pretty simple uh, one. There's just a few MI objects in here. Um, describing some rules for metadata delivery. Um, among other things, it does dip into the world of open caching and allows you to set some preferences for request routing. There's an object that specifies whether you'd prefer um, request routing to be DNS-based or HTTP-based, for example. Some rules on how you select open caching nodes. Um, sort of a, a grab bag of a couple of delivery options. Really a pretty small draft, not a lot there. Uh, but it, we move for that to be accepted as a working group draft. Next. We're almost done. Okay, private features metadata. Um, this is a new draft as well, uh, articulating a mechanism that we've come up with in the SVTA for um, DCDNs to advertise um, private features that they provide and for an upstream CDN to configure those private features of course, one can just start making up MI objects all they want, you know, new generic metadata objects. This is just a mechanism to put a little bit of structure on that. Uh, go next. Yeah, unfortunately, I skipped a slide here by accident, but here's an example of a generic metadata on the left here type MI private feature list. And then I have a list of private features, and then we have a structure to, to define in this example, Broadpeak is the provider of this private feature. They have a, you know, it, within their CDN, they have a feature called S4 streaming. And these are the various parameters that S4 streaming needs, what footprint it runs in, some various, you know, uh, properties specific to S4 streaming. Uh, there's an FCI object that goes with this as, as well that allows a downstream CDN to advertise what type of private features they support. And there's an alternate naming convention here where you can define the private feature um, right there as a generic, as a full MI object, which allows, uh, it allows you to get around some problems in the core structure of RFC 8006, where you might have inheritance and override and you don't want, 
you may need to call out the private features individually as opposed to a private feature list so that they don't get overridden by that by a um, path match overriding host match for example it's a, it's a subtlety but just wanted to get that in there um that's and then there's one final one in this family of drafts this one was authored by ben this is the um protected secrets and ben you want i'll turn it over to you and speak to this one Ben's still with us. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this this draft, uh, the only changes were, I think, a couple of spelling errors and uh, minor language changes, and adding uh, sequence diagrams for all of those uh, workflow steps. That big section at the end of the document. Yeah. And this, we're not really saying this is ready yet for last call, though, right? You still want some review on this? No, definitely. Uh, it needs some feedback because I'm not. I'm not sure anyone outside of SVTA has reviewed this draft yet. So we'd like to you know, get at least some feedback before we we ask for a last call for sure. Yeah. So Sanjay, you want to just go back up to the very first slide where we can see the list of all of these things to kind of put it all in context? Yeah, that one. Yeah, oh, one, one more, one after, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so like I said, this, oh, oh go I'm back. Into there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this should really be the end of us <laughs> tossing on uh, new docs to the pile for the for new MI objects. You know, of course, I'm sure there'll be minor additions and changes, but this is now a pretty stable set of work that we want to finalize. Um, there may be other things we put in on some related things around the APIs. Uh, but but for now, we want to kind of really just po put a bow around this and get it finished up. So. We need eyeballs on, on, on all of these, and you know, please put comments in the uh, in the working group distribution. That's it. Any comments? Oh, we got Kevin. Uh, yeah, um, I had a question about the private features one. Is mm -hmm. this just to it? It's creating a generic generic metadata object so that you can put anything you want into a generic metadata object. Is that sort of? Yeah, and I, I wish uh, Arnon was on to, to speak to it better because he came up with a lot of this. It is a way to have some structure around it, though, and with an FCI object to be able to declare that you can um, support it. But yeah, essentially, it is a generic, generic metadata object. I'm, I have concerns with that. I haven't read the draft, uh, so so I can't articulate it well, but it just seems like I'm not sure why we wouldn't just make generic metadata objects for you know, the specific things, but. Um, and you could do that. This doesn't preclude you from just making up MI objects as you as, as you wish. This just puts a little bit of structure on them because they had, it's almost like a, reg a registry of them in a way. But I, I hear what you're saying. But we already have a registry. And, yeah. and the registry doesn't require you to create an RFC. It just requires you to have a spec, right? Non-IETF yeah. specs can be registered in, in the IANA registry, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's worth you challenging this a little bit in the um, uh, on the mailing list. So if we read the draft first, but yeah. Right. I mean, Thanks. the other three did make sense to me. Yes, we should support HTTP2. We should support HTTP3, mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of thing. And and specific metadata object for open caching, certainly that's the whole point is so that you can create your own. I just don't know why we need to go that extra step for the private features. But yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's a good point. Um, Okay, uh, thanks, Sanjay. Um, I'll let Francesca go and then I'll come back. Hello, Francesca Palombini. Uh, as AD, uh, I just wanted to um, be careful of the charter scope that is like, I see that there is a, a lot of new individual drafts that are being brought to the working group, and I, I understand that. Uh, according to the authors, these are small um, necessary updates to existing work so that they should definitely fit in the charter. But um, our charter is pretty clear on the list of deliverables. Um, so I, we should probably consider that if there is, that maybe some of this work might need the rechartering to like make sure that it fits. Um, 
So just, I, I'm not saying that it definitely does, but <laughs> we might want to consider that for the new work. We've had discussions with the chairs about uh, uh, the, the first two drafts that were updates from ITF 118. Um, and uh, I checked the other individual drafts as Sanjay, as Sanjay said, that, that fits in the charter as well, the, the logging one, um, the logging extension. Um, but yeah, we should have that conversation before definitely going for adoption. Yeah, I, um, oh. I agree. Ahead, fact, you know, I was kind of going in that direction. So, so thanks, uh, Francesca, for bringing that up. So I think um, looking at the list here, I have a couple of you know, thoughts. One, uh, exactly what uh, Francesca said. So maybe as, as chairs, we uh, take up the responsibility to reviewing these drafts to making from the point of view that are they within the scope of the charter or does any of the work requires rechartering and what that would be. So I think that's something we can take. The, the second part is that uh, if let's assume that we determine that all of these are within the scope. Uh, so that's fine. Now, what, what chairs would like to see is actually a review done by others. So it would be great, uh, really literally, if Glenn, if there was another column here and you had a name of a reviewer assigned to that document, who will do a thorough review of the document. And I think that will really help speed up the process and, and not the chairs become the bottleneck of reviewing. We will certainly review it, but I think we also need, given just the, the sheer number of documents we have, it'll be really great to have at least a, an official name assigned to it that would be responsible for at least giving a review. And others, of course, need to review as well. And we wanna also know, you know who is implementing it and where that is getting implemented. So I think that would be really helpful um, from, yeah. from within the CDNI perspective, within IETF that yes, you know, there's support in, in the IETF community. There are members that are participating in the working group that are actually going to be implementing it. And I, and I assume the, the qualification, at least one qualification for being a reviewer is you're not one of the authors. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. It's it's kind of like picking a shepherd, and, and we traditionally have done pre-shepherd reviews, and, and which have been an in-depth review, and so far it's been chairs doing that. But I think we we need to expand that in order to be able to scale, and um, you know, so a shepherd can be anyone. A shepherd just has to not be an author, and you know, have the requisite um, yeah. technical. See, now I would have turned to Chris Lemons to do some of this for us, but is he now disqualified because he's a chair? <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, no, no. Uh, just can't be only. <laughs> I, I've agreed to do some of this. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we can go ahead and, and do this. And on the may, uh, maybe on the, on the distro list, I can kind of list these all out and start getting some consensus on uh, who should do this. Particularly, we're talking really for the four new drafts, right? Because the other ones are really pretty much down the road, right? I think actually the the existing ones, the cash control, the edge control, you know, those are pretty close. We're going to need to pick out shepherds for those anyway if we're going to do a last call. So we should address those first. But yes, for the new drafts, uh, I think we definitely should get more eyes on. I don't think people have necessarily had a chance to to review them yet. I know I haven't, um, but uh, hopefully we can see where that goes. Uh, I just wanted to address Francesca's comment. Yes, we should have a discussion as chairs on what our charter is. I think in hindsight, it makes sense that we didn't think about HTTP2 when HTTP2 didn't exist. Um, it makes sense for us to support it, but but we should discuss whether um, that requires rechartering. Yeah, from, um, from the description of the documents, it really felt like, oh, this is really more maintenance of the current document rather than right. new deliverables. And, and we, yeah, we might want to have a small rechartering to, to cover that more clearly. That shouldn't be contentious, I think, right? And um, the, the other ones, yeah, we can discuss. Uh, Glenn, you're muted if you're speaking. Thanks. Yeah, a lot of what we have here are, you know, definitions of families of MI objects that you know could have been piled on into 8006 but don't need to be in 8006 and so we originally actually called this extensions to 8006 but then kevin pointed out no we're really not extending it we're just making new objects that are 
that fit into that old, uh, definition already. So um, I think it, it fits in naturally as follow ons to 8006, but not really extensions to it or modifications. I don't know if that's and helpful. 8006 was designed to be extensible so that you could create new metadata objects. I think yeah. it is. But Francesca correctly points out we as chair should just, you know, go through the due diligence process and make sure that we are making sure that we are fitting within our charter and rechartering when necessary. Okay. So what's the word I want to use for asking for somebody to review these? A shepherd? Is that the right title? Um, I, I think as chairs, we, we, we can assign shepherds. Uh, that is our duty. Um, and, and so we will, but, uh, um, we should we should all review. I encourage everybody to to go and review these documents and and post to the list about it. You don't have to be a shepherd or an assigned reviewer, but we will begin assigning reviewers. I think to to help move things along. Yeah, yeah. I think particularly on these new drafts, we really need eyeballs on those. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. All right, I think so. That really was the last set of slides and. Um, Glenn, you did, you know, speed up pretty well. So I think that's good. Um, and I'm just making sure that we're not forgetting anybody. Looks like we have covered all the uh, topics. So I think in terms of the presentations, we have completed everything. But um, uh, anything anybody has in the room that they want to comment on? Anybody in the remote, anybody that's remote wants to comment? And if not, then we conclude the meeting. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, uh, everybody. 120. Safe travels, all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.